Well, good afternoon and welcome to Media Life from the News Hub. I am Paul Shugabo. Coming up this afternoon. <music> Supreme Court declares removal of heads of public corporations after change of government as unconstitutional. <music> and also this afternoon, we revisit Enam, who has vitiligo five years at the TV3 first interviewed him. Perspective leader of Saturday's failed coup. In our very first story, the Supreme Court has declared the removal of heads of public corporations after a change of government as unconstitutional. A seven-member panel presided over the decision that public corporations were part of the public services of Ghana and therefore such persons were public service officers whose appointments were protected by the Constitution. According to the Supreme Court, the appointment of heads of public corporations were governed by Article 195 of the Constitution. The court held that their removal must be done in accordance with the terms and conditions of their contract of engagement, or it must be justified as stipulated in Article 191 of the Constitution. Article 195, Clause 1 of the Constitution gives the President the power to appoint public service officers, but with the advice of the governing board of this specific corporation given in consultation with the Public Services Commission. Article 191B states a member of the public service shall not be dismissed or removed from office or reduced in rank or otherwise punished without a just cause. The Supreme Court has by this decision repealed the section of the Presidential Transition Act 2012, Act 845, which terminated the appointment of chief executives or director generals of public corporations, statutory boards and authorities upon the assumption of office of a new president. Other members of the seven-member panel were Justice Professor Ni Ashikoti, Justices Jones Doche, Sulek Badegbe, Anthony A. Benin, Samuel K. Ma on 4, 2017 by a legal practitioner, Teoflos Donko, with Godwin Eduji Tamaklo as his counsel. Teoflos Donko invoked the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court to interpret the 1992 constitution. Let's now engage a labor consultant, Ben Arthur, for his perspective on this ruling. And thanks for your time, Mr. Arthur. So as a labor consultant, you have followed this issue where several CEOs are made to go home after change of government. Does the Supreme Court decision bring finality to the matter? Yeah, thank you very much. And good afternoon to all your viewers and your crew members. I think it does. And for a very long time, some of us have held this opinion for, for quite some time. And we argued it out last Saturday. Coincidentally, I happened to lecture a group of people, and I was citing some of these positions. It is good. In fact, when the, the Presidential Transition Act, in of that is Act 845, in Section 14, mentions that when the there's an outgoing administration, all that appointees of it goes with it and the rest. As I referring to particular acts of parliament that have established public corporations which are not, you know, of commercial interest. So it's a very good judgment for all of us because why have we passed a law that says that the tenor of office, if you take NCIA for example, there may be the tenor of office of for the governing board is four years. Assuming that they were appointed in, say, October 2017, why then may they all have to resign when there's a new administration? They don't have to resign. They have to continue until the act that established them and their tenure of office expires. So I think that the ruling approves what we have already agreed several in all the various acts of parliament that establish other corporations. 
So how will this impact on the implementation agenda of political parties, bearing in mind that government have to work with persons they deem fit to work with? No, I, I do not think, uh, I don't think for this government, but let me tell you that if you look at the lines of thought of the sitting president, who is ready to let Ghanaians vote for their MNDC? I do not think that this serves a deal for any president or two. You know, we believe in the rule of law, and once the Supreme Court has got this ruling, it has to be complied with, you know. For me, we have done this over the years in error. Mm. We have done this over the years in error. And I've given you a typical example. If you take an act of parliament that establishes a certain entity and gives the tenure of office, and then they have the, the board has been duly constituted, what it means is that until other reasons arise for individuals to be dissolved, I mean, to be taken away from the board, they must serve their term. They must serve their term. And the, the, the provision in, under Article 195 of the 1992 Constitution as amended is not the power of the president appoint. Uh, it didn't touch that that side because it's very, very clear. This one has to do more with the tenure of office of people who have been appointed. I'm also of the opinion that going forward, I think we should start as Ghanaians. We will have to take away one of these two powers that the, the one appointing the board should not be given the To appoint people, mm. you know, that one too will be very, very helpful. But as we speak now, we don't have any contrary provision to that. So we keep on practicing that. But going forward, if we have the opportunity of amending the constitution, we need to do so so that people will really report to their boss. All right. Thank you very much for your time. And Ben Arthur is a labor consultant. You're still watching Midday Live from the News Hub. Let's now continue with the rest of our stories. Let's go to the central region where fishermen at Winneba have joined their colleagues at Jamestown requesting that government rather focuses on fighting light fishing than placing a month-long ban on fishing each year. The fisher folk want the Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture Developments to reconsider its decision. Winneba Beach is dotted with plastic waste, rubber, and human excreta. One of the major drains that carries water from the community into the sea has been turned into a refuse dump. The fishermen walk through the refuse to the other side of the shore. The fishermen arrived at the shore not too happy. Their complaint is no different from that of their colleagues at Jamestown in Accra. According to them, after the ban was lifted, it was only one canoe that had a bumper harvest a day after the ban was lifted. Next year, if the government wants to stop, you have to stop every canoe. Whether it's China, whether it's uh, Ivory Coast, whether it's Togo, you have to stop every, every canoe mm. from going to the sea. Then, after the one month, we will see what will happen. But this year, you mean it didn't go well? No, 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 it didn't go well at all. It didn't go well. But last week, they said you guys had a lot of fish oh, it's just one canoe. It's just one canoe. It's just one canoe. We did not get anything. There was no bumper harvest, even what to give to my mother and my sisters at home. I didn't get. According to the fishermen, the use of illegal fishing methods such as light fishing and chemicals are the cause of their problems. The problem is not placing a ban on fishing, but rather enforcing laws on light fishing. The fisher folks ex the Ministry of Fisheries and Agriculture Development as well as the Fisheries Commission to strengthen their monitoring on illegal fishing practices. In other news, so much has changed about her in the past five years, and it's not just limited to her physical appearance alone. In five years, she's lost much of her pigmentation, but has equally gained more. 
Wendy Lai went back to meet Laurentia Enam Honya half a decade after their first encounter. When I was in JSS, I, 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 I felt depressed always. Always I'll be crying. I even tried to commit suicide. It's one of those things. I want to be a nurse, a time presenter, and a model. That's what I always wish <laughs> to be. But... That was when I first met Enam in 2014. She was a final year nursing student at the Keta Nursing Training College. So much has changed in her life the last half decade. The most visible is her less pigmented body. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Mm. How are you? I'm well. Good to see you. Good to see you. It's been how long? Five years now? Yes. <laughs> she now resides in Amejope, in the Volta region, and is an enrolled nurse at the Amejope Health Center a job she has had close to four years. After years of enjoying social stigma, she learned to accept herself. Her confidence was shattered at some point, but five years ago, Enam decided she didn't want to feel the pain anymore. Her story is that of resilience, hope, and confidence in the face of adversity. Her colleagues and patients seem to ignore the visible distinguishing look. But was that the situation from the onset? About three years ago, while she was in a, she was in the car, and I saw her. My first impression was, what happened to her? Is it a fire burn or? But I thought maybe that's her skin tone. The way she teaches, even in the social gathering, it's lovely. First time I saw her. It was normal because I've seen her on social media. The first time I saw her, I was oh, a little scared because it wasn't common here. It was news in town that have you seen that tigerness, tigerness. We began to organize community gatherings where she begins to give us education on some vital issues. She became familiar to us. Enam first noticed a white patch on her skin, which looked like a birthmark at age 12. With time, the white patches kept spreading to other parts of her body. According to dermatologist, vitiligo is a condition where white patches develop on one's skin due to loss of color from areas of one's skin. The American Academy of Dermatology indicates People get vitiligo when their body attacks its own melanocytes, the cells that give us skin, hair, and other areas of the body color. Some people develop a few patches, while others lose much more skin color like Enam. In her late 20s, Enam's vitiligo is the universalist type, the most uncommon form, which is at the extreme end of the spectrum. Enam's late great-grand-aunt had vitiligo. One of her brothers, out of three, also has a condition. The mother of one has since our first conversation become a strong advocate for persons living with vitiligo. Her foundation, Vitiligo Ghana Foundation, educate pupils and students about the condition. The Amejope Technical Institute in the Volta region has benefited from her awareness campaign. I learned that fertiligo is not contagious and it can be treated but not killed. According to the Indian Journal of Dermatology, about 1 to 2 percent of the world's population suffer from vitiligo. Enam did not allow her condition to affect her dreams of becoming a nurse, despite the stigmatization she has faced along the way. Today, Enam is a nurse, model, for some brands and a vitiligo advocate. She has played a lead role in the movie on vitiligo, which is yet to be premiered. But she looks forward to becoming a TV presenter. She says her confidence was boosted by her first interview with our news team. So it gives me the platform to actually move around in society more freely than before because before people were not used to the skin or know what it is but after the story on tv3 i was able to get the exposure enam feels accomplished 
having come this far. Now I feel like I've embraced my skin. <laughs> I feel like I'm out of my shell to explore, to do more, to actually achieve more, to get people that are living with a skin condition to also achieve same like me, to be all out. There's no need for them to hide themselves. There's no need to have a suicidal thought or feel depressed about the skin. I believe embracing myself now is, is a big deal. On turning white, the nurse had this explanation to give. Within that five years, I've been doing a lot. So I think it's because of the stress that the white patch is coming more. It's also because my, my vitiligo is universal type of vitiligo that have to do with the, almost all the body parts. So it spreads to the body parts so quickly. With hope, courage and self-love, Enam believes she can still live her life despite her condition as she plans on feathering her education. Wendy Lai, TV3 News. Indeed, and I'm sorry, it's one of hope in the midst of adversity. He's still watching Midday Live from the News Hub. The 2018 Auditor General's report has identified major procurement breaches at the Ghana Export Promotion Authority. The report, among other things, cites questionable contracts in excess of 500,000 Ghana cities. There's more in the following News Dex report. According to the report, in September 2017 and February 2018, the former Executive Secretary of the Ghana Export Promotion Authority, GIPA, Gifty Klenam, awarded two separate contracts for consultancy services totaling $123,000, the equivalent of 542,640 Ghana CDs. But the Auditor General says GIPA could not provide documentary approval of the authority's entity tender committee for the procurement activities. According to the report, the authority had a functioning entity tender committee, but the contracts were not referred to it for approval. This was despite the fact that the individual contract values were above the executive secretary's approving threshold. Subsequently, according to the report, the department requested Ms. Gifty on the contract for for the payment of the remuneration and allowances to its members. It further requests authorizations are obtained. In addition, the 2018 Auditor General's report noted that clothing allowances amounted to 38,100 and her two former deputies for the period of June 2018 to December 2018. This was irrespective of the fact that the president had relieved them of their duties on June 7, 2018. The report again says that during a review of the authority's payroll records, it emerged that on June 11, 2017, a total of 54,340 Ghana cities was wrongfully paid to Mr. Eric Chu Mamwako in respect of soft furnishing. This payment was after he had already been paid rent allowance advance of 60,000 Ghana cities for the two-year period, July 2017 to June 2018, in of a fully finished accommodation. It recommends that Eric Chumamwakon should refund the amount or be surcharged. The final part of the report on GIPA indicates that in May 2017, the authority procured three Apple MacBook Pro laptop computers at a total cost of 24,675 Ghana CDs for the official use of Gifty Klenam and her two deputies, Eric Chumamwako and Akilu Saibu. However, all the three officials took along the laptops after they were relieved of their post. Gifty Klenam has however returned her laptop after she was informed of the anomaly. The Auditor General's office has requested the two men to either return the official laptops in their custody to the authority without further delay or in the alternative reimburse the authority with a prevailing market value of the Apple computers or be surcharged with a replacement cost of the laptops. 
A lecturer at the Faculty of Natural Resources and Special Science at the Namibian University of Science and Technology, Dr. Morgan Hauptfish, has supported calls by the people of Adakru for a localized management of the Kalatma Game Reserve. The wildlife scientist told my colleague Peter Kwao Adato that with a good business proposal on the management strategy, the local people could benefit. The people of Abutia, traditional area in the Volta region, in March last year, threatened to reclaim the Kalakpa game reserve from government. They accused the state of failing to safeguard safety of the reserve from wanton destruction and the poaching of the wildlife. Kalakpa game reserve is a protected wildlife reserve established in 1975 with the primary aim of protecting wildlife species in the Game is located on the foothills of the Togo Mountains stretching between Abutia and Abutia. Proud of the establishment of the reserve, the area used to be a spot hunting ground for expatriates, mainly Italians, Greeks and German residents in Ghana. Among animals in the typical Guinea savanna vegetation zone were a variety of buffaloes, antelopes, baboons, bushback, black dweka, and black and white colobus, among other smaller mammals. The reserve also has a spectacular combination of forest on the hills and long grass on the plains useful for tourism. Ironically, the Kalakpa Reserve is fast losing its natural resources to unacceptable practices like illegal logging and game poaching. This wanton destruction has led to near extinction of most of the game and wildlife, frustrating the indigents, hence the call for local content. Divulging rights to communities to preserve wildlife has been a positive step for us. Since this has happened in 1996, we've seen very healthy um, populations of wildlife developing in the country because communities are getting benefits from that wildlife. Team leader and senior lecturer at the Faculty of Natural Resources and Spatial Science at the Namibian University of Science and Technology says the call of the locals could bring an end to the present challenge. If communities feel that ownership, they do a lot more to protect wildlife. If they don't get rights over them, then the only thing of wildlife that they see are the negative impacts in terms of conflict, for example, elephants destroying crop fields or predators eating people's livestock. The Natural Resource and Spatial Science lecturer, who is leading a census in the Mole National Park, further spoke on steps that must be taken by the locals in the interest of the national asset. Well, I think if, uh, if the community is serious about that, approaching the Forestry Commission with a proposal on how the wildlife would be managed, I think would be positive. And it's also good to have partnerships. So um, in terms of having that knowledge, doing it hand in hand with park staff that have the knowledge would be, would be positive. Coming up is the MTN video report and today some pure reports from the Upper West region on inaccessible roads in the area. This section of the road was constructed in 2016 and left with a back feeling of the COVID to make the road accessible. The community people sometimes mobilize and fail portion of this covert to avoid being cut off from accessing the only health facility in Qatar. The whole covert has been washed up. It is left with some time for it to cut off. We are appealing to authorities to attend to this covert. If not, the next rains these communities will be cut off completely. San Puru reporting from Qatar in the Y East District, Upper West Region.
can also send your video reports via WhatsApp on the number 055-143-3044. You're still watching Midday Live from the News Hub. We have more news coming up shortly. Do stay with us. Hello again in business this afternoon. Cocoa production will be boosted in one of Ghana's production hubs following the resolution of a dispute in a lease agreement that forms an integral part of sustainable cocoa land tenure and ownership security. Tenant cocoa farmers and the land committee of the Sechi Rosso Traditional Council have for the first time met to build consensus over provisions in a proposed lease agreement. A report by Ibrahim Abubakar. Subsequent bulletins. You're still watching Midday Live from the News Hub. Let's now focus on tv 3 sanitation campaign and media general as part of its efforts to help keep the country clean is focusing on a sanitation campaign with the hashtag garbage out sanitation and action now and my colleague johnny hughes went to the kwame Koma circle and has the following reports It's a busy morning out here at the Kwame Nkrumah Circle in the capital of Accra and business is brisk here. But part of our sanitation campaign on TV3 is the hashtag garbage out. We've been asking the questions whether or not we'll be able to get to achieve the president's dream of making Accra the cleanest city in Africa by the end of his four-year mandate in 2020. Now right behind me after 9 a.m., you can clearly tell a heap of refuse right there you have a bunch of scrap dealers who are scavenging from the heap of refuse that you find right in the city center. This is certainly unacceptable and it mirrors the situation we have in many parts of the country where heaps of refuse are left unattended to. It does seem we have become so comfortable with filth that there is no way out. But as I always say, when you see something say something when you see somebody littering call them out and put them in their right space and will the city authorities act speedily or shall we sit and stare while this continues to go on johnny hughes tv3 news kwame nkrumah circle accra and still on sanitation let's go to the central region where illegal dumping of refuse and the beach of Winneba is along the coast. Our reporter Joseph Armstrong visited Winneba and reports. A punchy H. A Sabbath of Winneba along the coast is busy on Saturday morning. The rocky nature of the beach has lost its beauty. Illegal dumping of refuse and open defecation have become the order of the day. The rocks along the beach has become a fence between men and women who visit the shore to openly defecate. I'm currently at the center of where boys and girls here at Ponkoechi. On my left is where men or boys come to defecate. And on my right is where women or girls come to defecate because they claim there's not even a single public toilet here for them. More people arrive even after sighting our presence, but with caution and then several others arrived, this time without any caution. From the main Winneba London beach to Aponchi Echri and beyond, filth and human excreta have taken over. The residents admit to their guilt. Where do you guys defecate? At the shore. Why? Because there is lack of public toilets around. Mm. And where there are some, they are too far from here. So you always do it at the shore. Including yourself? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. So where do you dump your refuse as well? At the shore, at the same place. Mm, is it good? It, it's no, even though it's not good, but because we are lacking it here, I think that's the major reason why we do it there. Where do you guys defecate? 
at the seaside here. Yeah. But Assemblyman of Namba Electra area, Stanley Imprim, blamed the attitude of residents on the lack of public toilet in the community. It is estimated open defecation cost Ghana some 79 million US dollars annually through tourism laws, water pollution and death among others. The Sustainable Development Goal 6 aims to, among others, by 2030, achieve access to adequate and equitable sanitation and hygiene for all and end open defecation, paying special attention to the needs of women and girls and those in vulnerable situations. Ghana will need to do a lot more to tackle issues of sanitation, not only at Continue to defecate here in the name of there is no public toilet in the community. My name is Joseph Armstrong Gold, Alagwe TV3 News, Ponkwechi, Winneba. So do join Media General as we embark on the sanitation campaign. And it's the hashtag garbage out. You're still watching Media Live from the News Hub. Let's now focus on climate change and calls have intensified for African governments to invest more. Take measures. African Science and Center of Climate Change and Adopted Land Use together with the German government are investing some 10 million euros into climate change research in the region. Climate change is one of the fundamental threats to global development and to the chances of ending poverty. The risk caused by climate change to Ghana's development calls for sustained responsive action and adequate financing to carry out interventions. A representative of the Federal Ministry of Education and Research, Germany. Environment in the West African region. Climate change is affecting the lives of millions of people in all parts of the world and with really strong impact in West African ECOWAS countries. We will focus on these four fields and we offer for the research 10 million euro and the research will start at the beginning of next year. Executive Director of West African Science Service Center on Climate Change and Adapted Land Use, WASCA, Dr. Celebrating with other stakeholders to help Ghana meet the United Nations Development Goal 13, which focuses on climate action as well as their nationally determined contributions. So each country has received, and Ghana has received six weather stations to complement the of weather stations. And this is done in collaboration and partnership with directly because it's through the National Met. Since its establishment over 10 years ago, Waskal has trained more than 250 students in postgraduate training in climate change and is ready to support within the gained experience. Oh, well, that's it for me, Thanks so much for watching. I am Portia Gabo. Enjoy the rest of our programs. Good afternoon.